Pacific. Uh, more to this story than you probably uh, have read about, uh, and we're going to cover all of that. Uh, next up after that is March 17th. It is the Battle at the Cathedral. Now, this is an engagement that took place uh, in downtown Cologne, right near that uh, cathedral. And uh, it has the distinction of having been actually filmed by the United States Army uh, soldiers. And somebody who was there as a correspondent was Andy Rooney, someone you probably are familiar with. And our last program is going to be on April 7th, and it is the last battle in the Pacific. It is about Okinawa. And um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, our library. Um, we are currently open every day except Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we are here 10 until 3. And a couple of the amenities uh, I want to share with you. Uh, if you just want to come down and relax and decompress from your labors on the island, come on down. We have wonderful air conditioning. We have perfect Wi-Fi, thanks to our IT staff. And uh, we do have books, too, uh, books about World War II and a lot of other things. The World War II books you will find in 940-54. I also want you to come down and see the display uh, that we've put together. And... I've been very hard at work in the past year making some of the planes and models that go with the series. Like this is one of them, uh, the Blue Nose Bastards of Botany. It is a P-51. So you need to come down and see these things. Um, as always in these programs, there is a pop quiz. And we're going to do things a little differently this year. If you're participating and you answer incorrectly in the pop quiz, come down anyway and I'll give you a book. It's that simple. If you get it right, I'll give you two books. And um, yes, that's the pop quiz. Now we gotta get to the thanks. The thanks, this program could not be if it was not for a lot of very talented and helpful people. Um, our production staff, uh, Beth Gerald and Maureen Tesoro, thank you very much. And of course, our head of IT, Danny, step up, Danny, say hello. Here's Danny. There he is, partially. There, there he is. Thank you, Danny. Thank you very much. Okay, I think that is all of the uh, whys and wherefores. So let's get started. Yeah, there we go. Okay, this is uh, our map of the operations area of the program that we'll be talking about today. And uh, from the 3rd Yacht Division, about 5 o'clock, December 31st, 1945, a very interesting message was put out to all of the different squadrons and uh, groups. Varus 1145 Teutonicus. The next was uh, came out a little bit after midnight on January 1st, 1945. Orders for Harman time, 920 hours. And these messages were quickly picked up at Ultra. And you know, those are the people that did all of the decoding. And if we go back for a second and look at the word Harman, that has actually nothing to do with head of the Luftwaffe or Harman Goering. But all of those names, Varus, uh, Teutonicus, and Hermann, those were all uh, German um, people from the past. The people at Ultra, they weren't sure, and they didn't know that it was a signal to initiate something. They were picking up a lot of transmissions and intelligence that a lot of the squadrons and groups were moving east out of Germany to uh, forward air bases right along the border. They weren't sure what that was about, but they were going to find out. In our program today, oh, my clicker, oh, it's not working. There we go. Our program today is Operation Bodenplatte. Now, of course, this is a German word. You, you cut it up into Boden and Plata. 
Broden means ground. And a lot of people, when they're talking about this, they'll say base, and the word plata is plate. They'll say base plate, but it's more important to know that it was ground plate. And what the uh, program was for this plan, you will see in a second. Here we have Herman Goering on the left, and we have Dietrich Peltz on the right. Uh, Goering, his star was waning after several of the disasters of 1943 and 1944, which we have talked about in this program. If you remember last week, we talked, uh, last year, we talked about Big Week and the incredible losses that the German Air Force suffered. He was hoping that he could improve his reputation with Hitler if he presented the Fuhrer with a fantastic victory in the West. So he started moving all of these squadrons, all of these groups in hopes of um, putting something together to do that. On the right, we have Dietrich Peltz. He was head of the second fighter corps. He was basically responsible for the planning of Bodenplatte. He was later tasked with the aerial defense of the Reich uh, in March 1945 and actually advocated the idea of ramming, which was um, also picked up by other people. Uh, uh, hero, her, hero. Um, this was to halt the air campaign against Germany, even at the risk of sustaining very high casualties. And after the war, he worked for Krupp and Telefunken, and he died in August 2001. So let's talk about two people, very important. Um, Josef Priller, he was a wing commander. Uh, as an ace, he was credited with 101 enemy victories uh, in 307 combat missions. He was Commodore of JG-26 and was one of the only people who could actually stand up to Goring argue with him and actually walk away without any repercussions. He was against the plan of Bodenplatte from the very beginning. And after the war, he was a successful brewer and consultant for the movie, The Longest Day. Some of you may have seen that. The fellow on the bottom left, uh, General Lieutenant Adolf Garland, uh, he wanted to use the German Air Force in a different way. He wanted to deliver what they called de grosse Schlag, or the big blow. And how this was going to be done, they were going to send up a mass of German fighters all at once into the bomber stream and knock down as many uh, Allied bombers at once. His plan was rejected in favor of attacking the tactical fighters on the ground. Galland was against stripping the home defenses of the Reich in favor of such a risky plan. Both Priller and Galland predicted disaster, and we're going to find out if that indeed happened. So what was the plan? What was Bodenplatte all about? The goal, as I indicated, was to gain air superiority, and it was during the Battle of the Bulge. This was going to be December 16th, 1944. You remember in that campaign, the German army was going to cross the Meurs River and go to the Northwest and hopefully uh, capture Antwerp back from the Allies. This would be accomplished by a series of low level attacks on all of the tactical American and British airfields in Belgium, Holland, and France. Again, the operation was planned for December 16, 1944, but a number of factors intervened that prevented that from happening. And you see some of the things on your screen there, and a lot of those had to do with why that didn't happen. Well, of course, we had the weather. The weather turned very bad. This was, of course, the worst winter in Europe in 50 years. So because of the weather, that was uh, a factor. We see a very tough looking uh, American soldier. That is the fighting spirit of the American soldier personified right there in front of you. Um, and the Sherman tank there, what happened is that the Germans in the Battle of the Bulge, as you know, if you read about it, they were stopped fairly quickly. And they didn't, only some very advanced units reached the Meuse River. They weren't able to cross that. Um, and those are the factors. Uh, however, the weather did clear up, and they still could have gone on December 23rd or 24th. 
because again, the weather was good. Uh, but again, there was a change of plans. And the new date was set to be January 1st, 1945. That was when the German meteorolo meteorologists predicted that the weather would once again be clear. However, the problem is that the German attack in the Ardennes was halted. There was another attack that was planned, Operation Nordwind, a little further south, that this new plan was going to hopefully um, help them. And if successful, who knows, they thought that perhaps they could start the Ardennes Offensive once again and accomplish their ultimate goal of dividing the British and American armies. However, we know this didn't happen. Now, what's this guy on the right-hand side of your screen? What is that? Booze is my co-pilot? What the heck is that? Well, there's a lot of, well, if you want to call them urban legends, that the date for the attack was set because the Germans thought that all of the Allied pilots would be drunk uh, the night before, of course, New Year's Eve, who doesn't have a little something uh, on at night there. Um, they were hoping that uh, a lot of the Allied pilots would be too hungover to um, respond to an attack. And many of them were. There were a lot of parties at the forward air bases. And uh, again, a lot of uh, uh, pilots, they stumbled out of their bunks the next day uh, when something very big was happening. And this is the plan right here. The Germans were going to attack 16 Allied air bases from 38 different bases, starting from the north, uh, the Jagdgeschwaders 136, 26, 27, 54, 77, and the Kampfgeschwader, or the bombing the squadron from the north, and JG's 2411 and 53 from the south. It was planned that over a thousand planes would be flying at treetop level. Now, already we see a problem with this because the original plan for Bodenplatte was they were supposed to have 2,000 aircraft. They were only able to scrape together 1,000 planes. I think it was something like 1,035. And secrecy was a big factor in this plan. And ultimately, you will see how that worked against the Germans. Nobody was allowed to know about this plan below a certain level. In fact, a lot of the pilots who actually took off that morning from their air bases thought that this was just another simple uh, reconnaissance combat patrol. The targets for Bonaparte, they would be in Holland, Belgium, and France. As you can see, a lot of the uh, where the arrows are going just over the border um, into Belgium, into Holland, and a couple into France. And you can see the different routes where they all took. If you see the one, the far left one for JG6 going all the way around into the North Sea and around to attack those air bases over there those people were going to be in very big trouble. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, first, I just threw this in because the night before Boden Plata, in fact, the first, uh, the week before that, um, the first jet bombers uh, took off uh, on the mission over um, Brussels, over Liège, and over Antwerp. And they were basically unarmed, that they were reconnaissance and yes they were flying and there are some stories that maybe uh the first ones that actually had a reconnaissance mission overflew the normandy beaches in june however that uh, they would uh, have a couple of bombs on this mission on the night before new year's and they would drop a few bombs but actually none of, none of that really caused uh, any damage Okay, some of the planes we're going to see in this uh, operation uh, were variants of the Thought Wolf 190 and the ME 109 going top to bottom. Uh, we have the uh, 109 G4 and the K4. The, um, the Thought Wolf 190s are the A8 and the F8, but also we would see the long nose uh, FW 190Ds or for Dora. Uh, you'll see a picture of those later. Uh, the 109, um, 
much improved over the 109E version that you saw in the Battle of Britain. It had the uh, inverted 12-cylinder engine, the speed 386 miles per hour, 120 miller, meter, millimeter cannon in the nose, and two 13 millimeter machine guns. The pros for the ME109 that is highly maneuverable, uh, very light, but the cons is that because the undercarriage went up like this into the wings rather than down, um, there was a lot of undercarriage failures. The 109, uh, it had the radio engine, it had the BMW 801, it had a speed similar, 382 miles per hour. It had four 20 millimeter cannons in the wing and two 792 millimeter machine guns. Uh, the pros, very fast. It was a very solid aircraft and it could take a lot of punishment. Uh, its uh, undercarriage went up like this rather than the 109s, with, which went up. Uh, the cons, it was very, very heavy aircraft and they had the tendency of overloading uh, the 190 with different armaments packages like rockets, bombs, uh, et cetera. Um, here is a, a couple of airplanes we need to just talk about briefly. And I have the Pathfinders were JU-88s and JU-188s. Now, why did they need Pathfinders? Well, here's the deal. In 1945, in January, the majority of German pilots had very, very little training. They were lucky if they had 30 hours of training uh, in their aircraft. Now, there were reasons for this too. The fuel situation was bad. Um, the aircraft situation was deteriorating. And because of the inexperience of these pilots, they needed to have an experienced aircraft uh, and experienced pilots leading them to the target. And in some cases, this would not even work because several of the JU-88s got lost as well. Um, and they took off. Uh, from all of those air bases, which I showed you in the map, and they all uh, came together. They flew over the border at approximately 9 a.m. at treetop level, and then almost immediately, disaster struck in the form of German anti-aircraft units, again, because of the intense secrecy, and as I said, this worked against them because the uh, communications from the high command to these forward German bases, uh, the uh, anti-aircraft uh, units, some of them never got through. So they did not know that there was a large German aerial operation uh, about to happen. Now let's give them the benefit of the doubt because it, by this time, the only aircraft they were seeing were allied aircrafts. And I go back to the, uh, the pun that I used before last year. If you see a brown aircraft, it's British. If you see a silver aircraft, it's American. And the Germans said, if you don't see any aircraft, it's German. So these guys, they weren't expecting a mass of aircraft coming over, especially aircraft coming over at treetop level. And almost immediately, they started losing planes from friendly fire. Um, the Focke-Wulf 190s, like these of JG-1, uh, their target uh, was the St. Genis Westrom Airfield near Ghent. These uh, planes, uh, this uh, squadron and group, that, those are the ones that flew all the way around and out through the North Sea and came back and attacked actually from the West. Um, the aftermath of the attack on the airfield there at uh, St. Genis Westrum, uh, these are columns of smoke uh, arising from a bunch of destroyed spitfires. Now, when we come down to the end of the presentation, I'm gonna fire up my iPad and read to you um, the exact damages uh, at each one of the airfields. Uh, and it varies from the 16 airfields that were attacked. Um, I would also say that Again, a lot of the losses took place right at the German border from anti-aircraft, but a lot of these pilots, even with the Pathfinders, they got lost. They could not find their air bases, and they ended up 
either running out of fuel or turning around and going home, quite a few. Um, this, this Spitfire uh, represents the personal aircraft of the Polish group uh, that were at uh, San Jonas Westrem. And uh, the other thing that the Germans did not count on, see, they were expecting all of these uh, bases that they would take them all by surprise. And granted, some of them did. However, many of these uh, bases already had aircraft in the air going on their own missions to um, various places along the front. So a lot of the German planes arrived over an air base that there were no aircraft at. However, this area here, these Polish pilots were actually just coming back from a mission and the Germans were quite surprised to see that when they were attacked. Um, this is a Polish pilot. Uh, he was killed on the 1st of January. Um, again, they uh, were coming back from their mission. They were low on fuel. They were anxious to land, but then they had to mix it up with all these German fighters that showed up. Uh, on the right, this is uh, a 190 that was shot down by one of the Polish pilots. Uh, this is the plane of Unterofficer Gerhard Behland, who was killed. Uh, Seven of the 131 wing Spitfires were forced landed to damage sustained or, like I said, running out of fuel uh, during their air battle. This uh, was one of the Spitfires of the Polish squadron. This is an interesting slide I threw in. And here is an example of our FW-190D or Dora uh, with the very long nose. What happened is this was the plane of Lieutenant Theo Nibel. Uh, and actually a bird flew into his engine uh, in um, near Grimberg. Uh, he was able to make a safe landing near Vemel and was promptly captured uh, by a Belgian policeman. I have another slide where you can see him um, examining the wreckage. Uh, this is a close-up of the, the Jumo engine uh, on the 190 which we saw in the previous slide. However, the pigeon is not visible in this slide. This is the 190 uh, attacking at Eindhoven airfield. Now, as I said at the end, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna give you a breakdown of all of the losses that took place. However, Eindhoven is on the upper end because it was a very, very huge airfield. It was one of the airfields that the Germans had originally occupied uh, before they had to leave and there was a large number of uh, British and Canadian aircraft there. Um, the uh, problem with Commodore Kogler is that he was shot down. He overflew the Eindhoven um, airfield, but he flew over another airfield that was under construction where they were uh, marshalling a bunch of uh, anti-aircraft uh, units, and he was promptly shot down and killed. Uh, here are some of the uh, British and Canadian aircraft that were present uh, at Eindhoven and other of the air bases. We have the Hawker Typhoon, which was a ground, basically a ground attack uh, aircraft. As you can see, it's carrying a bevy of missiles. It could also carry bombs and uh, other armaments packages. On the bottom left, we see the Hawker Tempest. Uh, both had the Napier Sabre engine. Uh, a very fine uh, engine that could develop quite uh, a large amount of horsepower. And on the right, of course, we see the tried and true Spitfire. Uh, and as I said, a lot of these planes were present on uh, the air bases around Eindhoven. Uh, here is uh, one of the Haw Hawker Typhoons at Eindhoven. We're going to see a few of these pictures. Uh, and as I uh, said before, the losses at Eindhoven were uh, quite severe. Uh, here are 190s and 109s attacking Eindhoven, and those are the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force Spitfires of the 414 Squadron, and they uh, were able to get into the air. Not a lot of them, but they were able to get into the air. Uh, and here again uh, is uh, one of the, the downfalls of the German plan. Granted, the first wave that came through uh, of planes and the Germans had them stacked up in groups of four, 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 and four. And one of the first waves coming through, yes, they had uh, complete and total surprise. 
But by the time the second or third or fourth wave of planes came through, um, the anti-aircraft uh, gunners were alerted, they were ready, and they had their uh, gun sights set uh, just above treetop level so they could meet these planes coming in. And the Germans lost quite a few that way. Uh, here's one of the uh, paintings of the typhoons uh, on the Eindhoven airfield. Uh, this is the um, uh, Messerschmitt flown by uh, Gefreiter Alfred Michel. Uh, he developed engine trouble and was forced to belly land. Uh, he ended up with a large bump on his forehead, but was otherwise unhurt. This was Alfred Michel's first combat mission, and it ended up with him being a prisoner. Uh, the soldiers of the 90th in Infantry rushed in and captured him. Again, a lot of these pilots, they had very, very little experience. A lot of them, uh, like I say, they got lost. Uh, they crashed into the trees. They weren't able to keep formation. And some of them even ended up uh, attacking different airfields other than the ones they were supposed to attack. Oh, geez. Oh, daddy's not here. But um, yes, this is the, my wife's fault. She did this to me again, and I apologize uh, a lot for it. Oh, here's our pop quiz. And as I said before, play along at home. Please come down to the library. Even if you get the uh, answer wrong, I'll give you a book. Now, what was the largest battleship of World War II? Was it the Bismarck? Was it the Missouri? Was it the Congo? Was it the Yamato? Or was it the Comte de Cavour? I'll give you a second to think about that. Some of you don't need any time to think about that. So we will move on. The largest battleship of World War II was the Yamato, the Japanese battleship Yamato. At 71,000 tons, the Yamato and her sister ship, the Mushashi, were the largest ever built. If you stick with me and stay through the series, we're going to talk about the Yamato again. We will talk about the Yamato in April during the presentation on Okinawa. Uh, here's a picture of uh, two pretty important people. Uh, one actually a lot more important than the other. Kurt Tank, uh, he was an engineer and test pilot. Uh, he led the design department at Falk Wolf from 1931 to 45. He was responsible for the creation of several really, really important aircraft uh, of the German Air Force, including the 190, the TA-152 fighter, and the FW-200 Condor airliner, which was turned into a reconnaissance um, plane during the war, also uh, as a bomber as well. The other guy was Major Gunther Specht. Uh, he's inspecting uh, the rudder of his 109. He is one of the leaders of uh, JG-11, who is going to lose his life um, in the battle at the airfield Y-29 in Ash, and we're going to concentrate on that in a few minutes. Uh, here is um, a uh, 109 downed uh, near Frescoli in Metz. Uh, this is uh, UNSA officer Herbert Maxey. He took hits from an American anti-aircraft position. Uh, Maxis landed only 200 yards from the American position, and they actually shot him as he was climbing out of his cockpit. Uh, here's another uh, picture of a P-47 uh, Thunderbolt at uh, airfield Y-34 near Metz. Uh, going back, there's our friend Alfred Michel of Begat Geschwader 53, um, and he's looking at the, the remains of his airplane surrounded by soldiers of the 90th Infantry Division. It was Michel's first and last combat sortie. I imagine he was feeling pretty dejected at the time. Uh, here is a 190D long nose uh, by um, the, the pilot Werner Hohenberg. It was shot down during the operation. ME 262s of KG 51 joined in the attack on Eindhoven Air Base. 
And of course, they were virtually unmolested by Allied fighters. Now, we're going to talk a few minutes about the ME-262. Those of you who know a little bit about World War II aviation history, uh, this was basically the first jet fighter that was uh, used in combat. Now, um, I'm going to go back and tell you that there is a um, urban legend about the 262 and this operation. It's never really, really been proven that some of the uh, 262s from KG-51 were detailed to escort some of the other uh, uh, Geschwaders towards their target. They were supposed to take up station in the rear. And where the urban legend comes in is that they were told that they were to shoot down any of the German pilots that turned around and went for home. However, again, as you may know from studying this, the uh, horsepower and the speed of this jet aircraft was faster than anything that the Allies had at the time. Um, the piston aircraft, uh, they were hard pressed to bring them down uh, when they would attack. Uh, here we see them attacking uh, the airfield at Eindhoven. And I put all, though it was possible to shoot them down. Now, how was this done if they could go so fast? Well, what the Allied pilots would do is that they would stand off, they would watch the action happen, then they would follow the 262s back to their air base and destroy them as they were landing because of course they had to slow down to land. Or if they were lucky enough to be near the airfield when one of these 262s were taking off, they could shoot them down then. Uh, here is a uh, B-17 that was destroyed uh, during the attack. And below, actually, I threw that in uh, because this is what happened to Lieutenant Carl Halberg's plane uh, when he had the, his bomb go off underneath him uh, before uh, January 1st. He was lucky he did survive. Okay, I'm showing you this map of the Brussels Antwerp area, and there is a little uh, arrow there near Hasselt. I want you to also see just to the right, you see Maastricht, which that is part of Holland on the Holland Belgian border. And just a little bit south of Hasselt is a place called Asch, Belgium. And we are going to talk about that in a moment, but first, a couple of the American planes I want you to know about is, of course, the P-47 Thunderbolt. And we see two different versions here. The one on the top, uh, the brown aircraft, that was what was known as the Razorback. It had a Pratt & Whitney 18-cylinder, uh, two-row radial engine. It was very powerful. Uh, most of the pros of uh, this plane is that um, it was nearly indestructible and it could take a lot of punishment. Uh, this was a plane that was probably most feared by German troops and armored columns on the bottom uh, because they would show up uh, in their ground attack mode and destroy a lot of um, German equipment. Underneath that, we see a uh, P-51. But on the bottom comparison, you see the difference in size between the P-47 and the P-51. Now, the P-47 you see on the bottom there that is a bubble top canopy. That is one of the uh, later versions. Of course, the Mustang, as we know from when we were looking at Big Week <clears throat> last season, whenever that showed up to escort the bombers, it was basically a game changer. It had six 50 caliber machine guns and it could travel at over 437 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to get into a specific microcosmic part of this uh, uh, program where we're going to talk about the air base at Y-29 or ASH. Now, again, the Germans are coming across the border. Now, Y-29 at ASH was a forward allied air base that was only about 10 or 15 miles away from the German border. So it wasn't going to take very much for the Germans to catch these guys by surprise. But what happened is that the, um, the fighter group, the 366 fighter group, which had these P-47s that you see up here, they were actually launching a mission uh, early, early in the morning. And they happened to take off about 15 minutes 
before the Germans arrived. However, uh, eight of the P-47s under the command of Lowell, uh, Captain Lowell Smith, they took off and they were starting to circle around their airfield on their way on their mission to San Fifth. And they had uh, bombs under their wings. One of the P-47 pilots, I think it was Mel Paisley, looked off to the Northeast and they saw Y-34, which was the British base at Uphofen. They looked up there and they saw anti-aircraft bursts and um, they immediately, uh, they didn't know what was going on, but they assumed that there was then a German attack. And again, that was not a base that was in the plan that the Germans were going to attack. The, this uh, base at Y-34 was attacked by mistake, but it was served as a warning to the guys at Ash Y-29. So the uh, pilots, Lowell Smith, Mel Paisley, Bob Brule, who are we're going to concentrate on in a little bit, they immediately flew uh, up, they gained altitude because again, the Germans were coming in a treetop level and the uh, planes that were headed for Ash, they arrived just as the P-47s were diving on them. Uh, this is a, a picture of Y-29 and the conditions were pretty rough. Uh, they were, like I say, only a short distance from the Allied lines. It was rough, but how rough was it? The soldiers, uh, the ground crew, the pilots, all of them, they had to sleep in tents. And like I said before, this was the roughest winter in about 50 years. Each one of them got a helmet uh, full of coal, and that was supposed to last them uh, for the whole day and the whole night. And a lot of the pilots, they ended up sleeping uh, with as many blankets as they could, but also they would sleep in their pilot uh, um, gear as well. Um, what happened again is that, okay, the P-47s are flying, they're engaging these German fighters that are coming in, but on the field, uh, the same field with those P-47s, the 352nd fighter group had a uh, group there that was ready to take off uh, Colonel John C. Meyer in his P-51. He's in charge of these eight guys and they, he's sitting on the runway and he keeps asking for orders because his uh, flight is not supposed to take off for about another half hour or an hour. And their mission was to escort a bombing mission um, to Kassel. Uh, however, uh, he kept feeling that there was something going on. He didn't know what was going on. He kept asking for permission to take off. They kept denying the permission to take off. And then it, they, he looked off in the distance, saw all of these planes starting to come in, and he said, the heck with it. It's either going to be a medal or a courts martial. So he said, guys, we're taking off. So they start rolling down the runway. And this is one of the iconic shots from this whole uh, program. Here's John C. Myers, P-51. He's actually lifting off the runway. His uh, landing gear is coming up and there's a FW-190 coming straight into the airfield. And he sees it head on. He, instinctive, he instinctively um, hits the trigger um, on his machine guns and he shoots the FW-190 down. So what's going to happen here is uh, these guys, they really, uh, the P-47 pilots and the P-51 pilots, they really didn't uh, fraternize very much. But this was going to be actually a tag team match where they are going to help each other. Uh, here's uh, John C. Meyer again. And uh, one of his uh, pilots, also um, William Wisner, you're going to see his picture right here. Here's his plane, Moonbeam McSwine. So these guys came up with some pretty uh, unique uh, um, names for their planes. Whis Wisner was going to uh, get four on January 1st. A lot of these guys became aces on that day. Uh, some of the German pilots, 90% uh, of them, like I said, had very little experience. So. This was a time when the actual squadron 
and group leaders had to guide them to their targets. And one of them was this guy, Horst von Fassong. He ended up getting shot down. He was a very experienced pilot. And the story uh, over Y-29 that I'm going to tell you about in a moment involved him. Uh, here's another guy, Heinz Barr. He, uh, I believe he was the second highest scoring ace of the uh, entire war for the Germans. The first, as you probably know, was Eric Hartmann. He was three, uh, had 350 uh, victories. Also, Heinz Barr, uh, he survived the war, uh, believe it or not. Uh, 16 of his victories were in the Messerschmitt fighter. Uh, here's our guy, Bob Brühl. And we're going to concentrate on him for just a second. Um, he's unique because he was born in Belgium, but he also lived in Fort Myers until the end of his life. Uh, he flew the P-47. And his story, uh, if you ever saw the Dogfight series on HBO, uh, he uh, was part of that series uh, talking about his experiences at this time. He was a poor P-47 pilot with Lowell Smith, uh, and there's another P-47 pilot, uh, Jack Kennedy, not the Jack Kennedy. Uh, Bob Brohl had taken off, and he is following a, um, an FW-190 uh, that decided he, he'd had enough. He was headed back for home, so Brohl followed him, and because he was flying at so low, he was almost touching the ground. Brule could not bring his machine guns uh, to a point where he could shoot the uh, German pilot down. So they're flying along for miles and miles and miles and miles. And Brule pulls up alongside of the Messerschmitt pilot and he looks down at him. He can actually see him in the cockpit. And Brule said that he was tempted to pull out his 45 and shoot at him. But of course, he probably couldn't have got him that way. But after a few more minutes, the German pilot had to pull up because they were coming to a tree stand, and that's when Brule was able to shoot him down. And that is his one confirmed kill. His other uh, kill was unconfirmed. Uh, and again, this is what I was saying, that they started helping each other out. There was an FW-190 that was being chased by two P-51 Mustangs. And again, Brule was flying along and he kind of tilted his wings so he could see the pilot. And as he was doing that, the German pilot looked over and thought that Brule was coming for him. Brule couldn't have done a thing because unfortunately he ran out of all of his ammunition. So as he got closer, the German pilot thought he was coming for him. The German pilot pulls to the left and was able to be shot down by the P-51 Mustang. So Brule, being out of ammunition, he says, oh, the heck with it, I better go home. So he turns around, he starts flying back to his airfield, he's coming in, and the anti-aircraft gunners are just so crazy, they're so trigger happy, they're shooting at everything, they started shooting at him, so he waggles his wings to tell them, hey, hey, it's me, I mean, you guys see us every day, this is a P-47, it's not a German plane, uh, so he was able to uh, finally land without being hit. And that is uh, Bob Brule's story. A um, couple of the German pilots. Uh, this is one guy that I thought was interesting. Um, he uh, was only 19 years old, like a lot of these guys were. Uh, they were just teenagers, and they were putting them into these sophisticated aircrafts. And like I said, there was time when there were more planes than pilots. Uh, so a lot of um, the, the um, younger guys had to be put into these planes. Um, he made it to the end of the war, actually, and but on the, uh, the big day he got lost. He flew past his airfield and landed at another German base, but his comrades were very happy to see him when he returned. The guy down on the left, um, Heinz Killian of the uh, first JG-1, he wasn't so lucky. Um, he was an ace with eight victories. However, he was shot down on January 1st. He tried to bail out. He jumped out, but his parachute would not open. Uh, this is a good story. You're going to like this one. Uh, this guy, uh, Raymond Litke, he was a P-51 uh, pilot. Uh, he downed one FW-190 at Ash and followed another plane almost the whole way to Paris before the German plane ran out of fuel and 
crashed. Uh, the interesting story is that, um, oh, wait, we wanted to tell you, there's, that's Captain Lowell Smith on the right. Uh, he was in charge of the uh, P-47s at Y-29, and he was the one that spotted the, um, the either him or Mel Paisley spotted the uh, attack coming in. And this is Ray Litke's P-51. You see, it looks a lot like this one that I made for you guys. Of course, the blue part isn't showing up, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, Litke uh, was part of the P-51 squadron that was uh, led by John C. Meyer. And uh, this guy up in the left, Alden Rigby, he was a P-51 also. And he uh, was Litke's wingman. As they were flying, um, there was a, uh, an FW-190 coming down on, on Litke from behind. And uh, Rigby said to Litke, break left, which means you know fly over to the left. And again, this was one of the things where when the German pilot went to the left, Rigby was there, he pulled the lever on him and he shot the plane down. Rigby when it would end up uh, with uh, four planes that day, and it said, but he didn't become an ace until until 2000. It was that fifth plane that he said he shot down that they couldn't prove, but eventually they did, and he was given his ace status. And that fifth plane was Gunther Specht, the Commodore of JG-11, the, the very German um, squadron that attacked Y-29. And believe me, it wasn't very easy to shoot Speck down because he had all kinds of victories from the Eastern Front, from Italy, from the Western Front. And it was one of these things where he was one of the last planes that was flying over um, Y-29. And there were four P-51s after this guy, and he kept evading each and every one. He would make it a maneuver, he would do a split S, he would do a barrel well all the way around. And all the P-51 pilots, they were just barely able to like uh, shoot uh, beside him there or, or try to get his engine or tail. But eventually he pulled up like this. And one of the P-51 pilots, Sandy Motes, who, by the way, would uh, end his career as a lieutenant general in the Air Force, he actually got one hit on the uh, German pilot as he was flying straight up. When he came down, he came down right in front of Alden Rigby. Alden Rigby pulled the trigger on him and he was shot down. Mel Paisley, he was uh, one of the P-47 pilots we talked about. Uh, he was following a FW-190 that was making a quick turn. He, on his P-51, I'm, I'm sorry, on his P-47, he had rockets under the wing. Not rockets to propel, but rockets to shoot with. He fired one rocket, missed. He fired another rocket and missed. But then when the German pulled around and back towards him, he shot him with another rocket and shot the uh, German pilot down. Uh, this is Mel Paisley with Jack Kennedy. Uh, they're posing with part of the wing. Jack Kennedy's story, uh, he was a P-47 pilot. And what happened very early in the uh, attack, he was hit by several German planes. His wing was on fire and he was desperately trying to pull up, pull down and gain speed so he could put the fire out. And there was a plane, German plane coming in on him just ready to get him. And a P-51, uh, one of the other P-51 pilots pulled around. He shot the German down and Kennedy was able to go back and land. Uh, Paisley, he got three confirmed kills and damaged five more. And Kennedy, on that day, he got one plane. Okay. Uh, this is kind of nice. I like to throw this in here. Uh, this is a monument at the airfield of Y-29. Uh, it's constructed in 1944, and it commemorates the 366th Fighter Group and the 352nd Fighter Group, who, as I said, uh, cooperated with each other in meeting this attack. And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read to you uh, the, the ending here. Wow, uh, the cost. There was a lot of Allied aircraft that were destroyed. I'll let you read that. I'm not going to read all the way through it. Um, the, the Brits and Canadians lost a lot of Hawker Typhoons and Spitfires on the ground. Uh, the Germans, again, because so many of these guys were inexperienced, 
As soon as they started mixing it up in combat, they didn't do the right maneuver. They weren't able to get away. And these American pilots, the P-47 pilots, the P-51 pilots had a lot of experience by then. And they shot down the German planes uh, in droves. So you see the losses. And my um, assessment on the bottom there, uh, a tactical victory, a lot of sources will give the tactical victory to the Germans, but I'm going to say it's a draw because although the initial wave of those low-level attacks caught the Allies off guard, all of those following waves, as I said, sustained severe casualties from the anti-Allied aircraft uh, position. As I said, a lot of them were uh, from friendly fire as well. And of course, the strategic uh, victory goes to the Allies. The Allies were able to replace the planes that were lost, uh, maybe in a matter of two, three weeks. The pilots, the same thing. Very few of the American and British and Polish pilots uh, were shot down. Again, as I said, an enormous amount of the, uh, the German pilots were. The German pilots and losses of planes, uh, especially, this is the big thing, especially the senior staff and the senior experienced pilots that were killed, shot down, the Commodores, uh, they were not replaceable. Now, um, what I want to do is read the... Um, All right, very quickly, uh, the raid on Antwerp is considered to, uh, to have had very light damage. Uh, one aircraft was confirmed destroyed, uh, around 15 were damaged at Ash. Again, because as I read it to you, uh, those planes were already in the air, the P-47s were in the air. So the Germans really didn't have a chance to get at the planes that were on the ground. Uh, what they suffered on the ground was one B-17 aircraft uh, that was destroyed and the pilots and the uh, ground crew said, you know, big, no big loss because it was already uh, probably too damaged anyway. The uh, raids on Brussels, uh, one of the uh, airfields at Brussels, the damage was very severe. They lost 34 aircraft and 29 destroyed. Uh, the other Brussels raid, all six of the aircraft that were present were destroyed. Uh, Eindhoven, as I said, Eindhoven suffered the most damages. Uh, they had 124 planes uh, lost. Uh, most of them were typhoons, spitfires, and tempests. Uh, that su they suffered the uh, highest casualties uh, and destroyed uh, planes. At Ghent, there were 16 destroyed aircraft. Uh, Giltz, Raijan, Hirsch, and Lecotte, uh, little or no damage whatsoever. Uh, at Metz, uh, very, very heavy damages to the airfield at Metz, 22 destroyed and 11 damaged. Uphoven, as I said, which was attacked by mistake, uh, they had one plane destroyed and six damaged. At uh, Ursel and Vocal, those were also attacked uh, by mistake. Uh, not very many uh, aircraft uh, were destroyed. So that is the end of our presentation for today. I want you to join me again on February 9th where we will uh, talk about the divine wind for the kamikaze. Thank you very much. Stay safe, be careful, and make good choices today. Thank you.